So as we've previously discussed, the skeletal system is divided into two parts, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. And the axial skeleton that you can see here illustrated in this figure is composed of the bones that are found along the central axis of the body. And we typically divide these bones into three different regions. There are the bones of the skull, of which there are a total of 29, the vertebral column, which includes 26 bones, and then the thoracic cage, which has about 25 bones. Now the appendicular skeleton is going to attach to the axial skeleton at two different locations. We've already talked in this course about the sacroiliac joint, which is going to attach the lower limbs, and the upper limbs are going to uh, attach to the axial skeleton at the sternoclavicular joint. In terms of functions, we discussed several functions of the skeletal system as a whole, uh, and probably one of the most obvious was the muscle attachment. And that's certainly true for the axial skeleton as well, though this skeleton has a few additional functions that aren't necessarily met by the appendicular skeleton as well. So the axial skeleton has a lot of organs to support and protect. It takes care of protecting the brain, the spinal cord, heart, lungs, major blood vessels, and most of the internal thoracic and abdominal organs. It also has the ability to house and protect all of the special sense organs, which are gonna be found up at the skull. And then in addition, the spongy bone that is found in the axial skeleton is the primarily responsible for uh, blood cell formation as well. So let's go ahead and begin with the vertebral column. The vertebral column is responsible for providing vertical support for the body. It's able to support the weight of the head, help to maintain your posture, and also to help transfer the weight of the axial skeleton to the appendicular skeleton of the lower limbs. It also houses and protects that spinal cord, as we mentioned, which is very delicate, and, and it also provides a passageway for the spinal nerves as they leave the spinal cord itself. The adult vertebral column consists of 26 bones, including 24 individual vertebrae, and then also the fused vertebrae that form the sacrum and the coccyx. The uh, sacral and coccygeal fusions don't usually start until about age 20, and they're actually not complete until middle age, so I'm betting that a lot of you that are watching this probably still have these bones that are not actually fused. The vertebral column provides us with some flexibility because it is not completely straight. And so if you're taking a view of the lateral perspective, like you can see here on the right, you can see several distinct curvatures. So we can divide the vertebral column into five distinct regions, which you can see here on the right-hand side. There are seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, the sacrum, and then the coccyx as well. Those seven uh, cervical vertebrae are gonna form the bones of the neck. And then that very first one is going to also articulate with the skull. Those 12 thoracic vertebrae are going to be in the superior region of the back. And each one of them is going to articulate with one or two pairs of ribs as well. The lumbar vertebrae are in the lower back region. And then below that, inferior to that, is where you're going to find that sacrum and the coccyx. Some people will use a little um, kind of mnemonic device to remember the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebrae by thinking about the 7, 12, and 5 when you would eat breakfast, when you would eat lunch, and when you would eat dinner. You'll also notice that the vertebral column has some very distinct curvatures to it, and this provides some flexibility in, the, um, in this column. The curvatures are named based off of which vertebrae they're composed of, and they appear at different uh, times, actually, during uh, fetal development and early childhood development. So the thoracic curvature and the sacral curvature are considered to be primary curvatures, and that's because these are already present in a newborn child. The cervical and the lumbar curvatures, however, are referred to as secondary curvatures, and that's because they actually appear after birth. So that cervical curvature usually occurs around three to four months of age, and you can usually tell that that's formed once you can see it, that a child can hold up their neck. And the lumbar curvature is going to be a little bit later, usually about the first year, when that child is learning to stand and to walk. As a little bit of a fun fact, um, all, almost all mammals still have seven cervical vertebrae, regardless of their body size. So for example, this is part of the skeleton of a giraffe. That does also have the exact same number of vertebrae in its neck as you do, but as you can see, the uh, giraffe's vertebrae are quite a bit larger. 
So as we go through these articulations of the axial skeleton, I want you to keep in mind this figure that you were introduced to earlier. This is kind of showing our, our organization of our structural classification of joints. So we talked about three different types of fibrous joints, two of which are synarthroses and one of which is an amphiarthrosis. Two types of cartilaginous joints, which is one is a synarthrosis and one is an amphiarthrosis. And then the various types of synovial joints that we have, all of which are diarthrotic. I'm going to be using these color codings that you can see here in a lot of our figures to um, kind of as a shorthand for what these structural classifications are. So anytime you see anything in red, that's re um, referencing it as a synovial. Orange is cartilaginous, green is fibrous. And then if you see the green outlined, um, either one of these outlined in purple, that means it's a synarthrotic. And then it outlined in blue is going to be an amphiarthrotic. We're not going to worry at this point about um, labeling a sh or any kind of a shorthand for the different types of synovial joints, um, at least from our figures. We're just going to code all of them with the same uh, with the same coloration. All right, so let's start with the articulations that are occurring between the different vertebrae. There are actually four different types of articulation that can be found between these vertebrae that we typically put into four different classifications. The first ones that I want to consider are the two different types of intervertebral joints, and this is they, this is just simply the anatomical name of these. Uh, and these intervertebral joints are responsible for extension, flexion, and then lateral flexion of the vertebral column. This image here is showing you two different lumbar vertebrae. I'm going to use these as an example just because of their size here. And in this image, you can see uh, very well the two different types of intervertebral articulations. So the first type of intervertebral joint uh, occurs where the vertebral bodies of adjacent vertebrae are going to meet. And then the second one is going to occur at the superior and inferior articular processes of the adjacent vertebrae. And so you've got two, let's consider this top one here, two um, inferior articular processes, one on the left, one on the right, two superior, though here on this image you can see how it's not articulating right now with another vertebrae. So this specific vertebra right here is going to articulate with, uh, is going to include six different articulations between it and the adjacent vertebrae. So three in the superior region and th uh, three in the inferior region. That articulation between the vertebral bodies is an example of a cartilaginous symphysis, which should tell you a little bit about the composition of that disc that's in between them. And then the articulations at all of those processes, the inferior and superior articular processes, are synovial planes. Let's look a little bit more at those intervertebral discs and the ligaments that are involved with them as well. So we know that this being a cartilaginous symphysis, it, con it contains fibrocartilage. And this disc can be divided into two different regions. The nucleus pulposus is the inner region and then the annulus fibrosis is the more gelatinous outer region. These discs are able to absorb shock and they also resist uh, compression. Over the course of the day, those discs are going to be compressed and your height actually shrinks by about 1.6 centimeters per day. But then overnight when you're laying down, there, these discs are all able to expand to their original form and you're back to your normal height. So you're always going to be tallest in the morning. As for these other ligaments that are here, you're going to have longitudinal ligaments that are running the entire length of the vertebral column on both the anterior and the posterior sides. And the posterior one is going to be a running in the vertebral canal, and it's thinner than the anterior one, um, in part to accommodate the space of the spinal cord. You also have interspinous ligaments that connect the spinous processes of adjacent vertebrae and a supraspinous ligament that connects all of the spinous processes. And then finally, you also have the ligamentum flavum, which connects the laminae of adjacent vertebrae. And I'm bringing up especially these uh, purple ones that you see here, because we're going to come back to that a little bit later when we are looking at specifically how this ligament is uh, adapted to support the skull itself and help to facilitate some of the movement of the skull. In that region, it's referred to as the ligamentum nuchae. So from a clinical perspective, uh, what can go wrong when it comes to uh, looking at these intervertebral articulations um, at the bodies here? So I mentioned already the two components of the disc, the nucleus pulposus, which is the more watery um, con um, 
portion of the disc and then also that annulus fibrosus. Here in this figure you can see an example of what happens when you have a herniated disc which you've probably heard of before and that's when you're going to have that nucleus pulposus push through the annulus fibrosus and ultimately end up pinching the spinal cord or the spinal nerves and here you can see example on this side on the right of the uh, nerve roots on the anterior and posterior sides coming from the spinal cord and then here on the left where we have this herniation occurring you can see the disc is actually pushing on that nerve root and so the pain that you're going to have um, that's going to be generated from a herniated disc is going to in part be determined about where it's coming from so if you have a herniated disc in your cervical region it will tend to result in pain in the arm lumbar region pain in the leg most of the time this is treated with kind of a wait and see type of strategy um, or through a, a physical therapy, for example. But if it gets severe, then uh, the, the bulge can actually be uh, surgically removed and um, potentially even um, they're trying to develop new technology to uh, create artificial discs so that they could actually remove the, the disc as a whole and um, replace it with an artificial one. From a clinical perspective, we can also consider how the vertebral column can develop an abnormal curvature. Uh, three types that we're going to consider here. Kyphosis is the first one. This is sometimes also referred to as a humpback or a hunchback, and this is due to an excessive posterior curvature in the thoracic region. Most of the time this will develop, as you can see here on the right, uh, due to osteoporosis that is going to cause a weakening in these anterior portions of the thoracic uh, vertebrae and eventually leading to their collapse. A second type of abnormal curvature that you may have heard of is scoliosis. So scoliosis is an abnormal lateral curvature of the vertebral column. And scoliosis is the most common vertebral abnormality that's found among girls. Uh, this cause is actually unknown, but it may result from weakness in the back muscles um, that can be caused due to differential growth rates on the right and the left side, or due to differences in the length of the lower limbs. And then lordosis is the third. This is an excessive anterior curvature of the lumbar region, and it's most commonly associated with obesity or sometimes appears late during pregnancy. That an anterior curvature is trying to accommodate for additional body weight in the abdominal region, and so it kind of shifts the line of gravity that carries the body's weight when you have that um, additional weight that you're carrying in that abdominal region. This abdominal curvature can reverse itself when that weight is reduced either to, um, due to losing obese weight or due to um, after actually giving birth. We also have a few types of special intervertebral joints when we come and look um, at the uh, cervical vertebrae specifically. So I mentioned there were seven cervical vertebrae. And C, both C1 and C2 have uh, specific names to them. They're referred to as the atlas and the axis. The atlas is the bone that is articulating with the skull itself. And then the axis it articulates with the axis as well as C3. You're not going to find a lot of difference between the structures of C3 through C6. The biggest difference with C7 is this is going to be the first vertebra that doesn't have a bifid spinous process. So at the point where the atlas is going to articulate with the skull, we refer to this as the atlanto-occipital joint. This is a synovial condylar joint. This is the joint that um, a lot of times I will think about as your yes joint. When you're nodding your head yes, then that is the joint that is moving. Likewise, if you were to tip your head to the side so you're trying to touch your ear to your shoulder, that is also occurring at that or primarily occurring at that atlanto-occipital joint. There's also the atlantoaxial joint, and that is going to be the point of articulation between the axis and the atlas below it. This is sometimes referred to as your no joint. If you are shaking your head no, this is the joint that's moving. So this is a synovial pivot. It allows your head to pivot on these vertebrae. In addition to articulating at those articular processes, there's this additional articulation between these two. Um, the atlantoaxial joint specifically is going to be located at this region. The axis has a superior projection that's referred to as the dens. It can also be called the odontoid process. And this is then articulating with a specific facet um, that is on the atlas, and that is where that rotational axis, axis is going to occur. So those are all of those intervert, uh, those articulations between the different vertebrae that we've talked about. The atlanto-occipital, atlanto-axial joints, synovial condyle, synovial pivot, 
and then the intervertebral joints that are synovial planar joints and the intervertebral joints that are cartilaginous symphyses. So let's continue moving inferiorly and uh, consider the vertebrocostal joints. These are the joints that are going to occur between the ribs, costal uh, references ribs, and the vertebrae themselves. So between the vertebrocostal, literally between the vertebrae and the ribs. The thoracic cage is the bony frame around the chest that consists of the thoracic vertebrae posteriorly, the ribs laterally, and then the sternum on the anterior side. This acts as a protective cage around the vital organs such as the heart, the lungs, the trachea, and the esophagus, and it also provides attachment points for many muscles that support the pectoral girdles, the chest, the neck, the shoulders, the back, and the muscles that are involved in respiration. There are 12 pairs of ribs that articulate with the thoracic vertebrae. Ribs one through seven, which are color-coded here in kind of this tealish color, are referred to as true ribs. So at the anterior body wall, the true ribs each connect individually to the sternum by separate cartilaginous extensions that we call costal cartilages. These cartilages are made out of hyaline cartilage. Ribs eight through 12 are called false ribs because their costal cartilages do not attach directly to the sternum. Uh, the costal cartilages of ribs 10 through, uh, eight through 10 fuse to the costal cartilage of rib seven and thus indirectly to, uh, articulate with the sternum, while the last two pairs of ribs 11 and 12 are called floating ribs because they don't articulate with the sternum at all. Each rib is going to articulate with a vertebra in two different locations that you can see here marked as synovial planes. So if we looked at the shape of a, of a rib, you're going to see that at the region that comes to the vertebra, um, it kind of makes this little curve. And you're going to see an articular point that is on a little projection that's called the tubercle, and then another point of articulation at the head of the rib. This point that's at the, uh, at the tubercle, this is an articular facet that is going to articulate with the transverse process of the vertebra, while the point of the head is going to articulate with the uh, vertebral body itself. If we look at the vertebra, we can see that on that transverse process is what we refer to as a costal facet. And then at the um, body of the vertebra is the costal demi facet. Demi um, sometimes refers to as like part of or half. If we look up over here at this photograph, we can see that here is the uh, shaft of rib number nine and it's gonna curve around and the articular facet for the transverse process is going to also articulate with uh, the T9 vertebra, so the same number. But then if we look at the articulation at the head, this, um, the head of the rib is going to articulate with the superior costal demi facet of T9 and the inferior costal demi facet of T8. So when those two costal demi facets come together, they're going to kind of form a larger facet for that um, region to attach to. Both of these are uh, classified as synovial planes. So that takes care of our vertebral costal. Let's move on now to the anterior part of the thoracic cage to look at multiple types of sternocostal and costochondral joints. Again, costal means rib, so sternocostal, the sternum and the rib, and then the costochondral rib and cartilage. There are two types of sternocostal joints. We have uh, the joint between the, uh, rib number one and the sternum, and then the joints between ribs two through seven and the sternum. Rib one connects via a cartilaginous synchondrosis, while ribs two through seven are synovial planes. So this gives a little more anchorage to that, the most superior part of that thoracic cage. Why do we need these to be planes? You, your thoracic cage does need to be able to move because you can, you can even feel how your thoracic region, how your chest expands when you breathe in and then it collapses when you breathe out. So you actually need these bones to be able to move. On the other side here of this figure, we can see where the costochondral joints are. So these are the ones that are occurring between the ribs and the costal cartilages. All of these are going to be cartilaginous symphyses, uh, cartilaginous synchondroses. And last but not least, the lumbosacral joint. This is allowing for extension, flexion, and lateral flexion of the vertebral column. And the lumbosacral joint has two points of attachment. There is the articulation between the lumbar body and the base of the sacrum, 
which is a cartilaginous symphysis, just as all of the ones are that are between the vertebral bodies. And then you have the two uh, superior articular facets of the sacrum that are articulating with two inferior articular facets of, um, of the L5 vertebra. And those are going to be synovial planes, just like all of those other intervertebral joints that are occurring at the articular facets. So that completes our entire classification of our axial skeleton, our skeleton articulations. So let's go back to this figure from before. Um, I would like you to go back and take all of those, test yourself now here, and try to take all of those articulations we just named, and if you need to look at the last page on your lab manual, that's fine, and try to put it into one of these five boxes and see if you can come up with any generalizations there as well. Okay, hopefully you were able to deduce that so far we haven't talked about any fibrous joints, so none of these axial skeleton, skeletal articulations are going to be fibrous. So what about some cartilaginous synchondroses? Do we have any of those? Because remember that the uh, cartilaginous synchondroses would be classified as synarthotic joints. This would be a case with the sternocostal number one, so where that first rib is articulating with the sternum, and then all of the costal chondral joints, all of the points where the ribs articulate with the costal cartilages. So how about a cartilaginous symphysis, which would be classified as amphiarthrosis? All of those intervertebral articulations that are between the vertebral bodies, and then also the lumbosacral that's between the vertebral bodies. Everything else is going to be synovial. So the intervertebral and lumbosacral that are articulations between the articular facets that are on the articular processes, those are planes. The vertebral costal between the vertebrae and the ribs at those two locations, are that's also planar. Sternocostal two through seven, plane. Atlanto-occipital is a condylar, and atlanto-axial is a pivot. So now let's make the transition to the appendicular skeleton. Just as in module one, how we were covering the, the uh, pelvic girdle and the bones of the lower limb, here in module two, we're gonna be looking at the pectoral girdle and the bones of the upper limb. So the pectoral girdle is what ends, ultimately ends up connecting the upper limbs to the axial skeleton. And it consists of a clavicle on, on each side of the body and a scapula on each side of the body. Upper limbs consist of a total of 30 bones per limb. We have the humerus in the upper arm, the radius and ulna in the lower arm, the bones of the wrist, the bones of the hand, and ultimately the bones of the fingers. And so hopefully you are seeing uh, some analogous components to the lower limb where we had one bone in the thigh, two in the lower leg, and then the bones of the ankle and the foot and the toes. We're gonna do this the same way and go through these the same way we did with the axial skeleton, starting proximally and working our way distally through the arm. So the sternoclavicular joint, this is the articulation that is connecting the upper limb to the axial skeleton. And this articulation contributes to the elevation and depression, the protraction and retraction, and the circumduction of the upper limb. This here is a posterior view of the upper limb, the sternum, and the pectoral girdle. So we can see the sternum here, and then our clavicle scapula, and then the humerus. So to just kind of give you a little bit of a 3D perspective, so we're rotating around. Now here's the anterior part, looking at it from the superior view as well. And we can see right where this clavicle is going to articulate with the sternum itself. Let's go ahead and get rid of that humerus so we can get a slightly better view. As I mentioned, the sternoclavicular joint allows for movement of the clavicle in three different planes, uh, predominantly in the antero, posterior, and vertical planes, although some rotation can occur. Uh, the best description of this movement would be, or the most prominent the movement that we're going to be able to witness is the elevation and depression. Something to keep in mind is that muscles don't act directly on this joint. Although most of the actions of the shoulder girdle and of the scapula will cause some motion at this articulation. The sternoclavicular joint has a very unique double hinged articular disc, and it's gonna be found here at the junction between the head of the clavicle and the manubrium of the sternum. And this is going to allow for movement between the clavicle and the disc during the elevation and depression. And then the disc is going to move um, uh, the movement is going to occur relative to the disc and the sternum 
uh, during the protraction and retraction. As a result of these motions, the sternoclavicular joint is classified as a synovial saddle joint. The ligaments that uh, help to support this articulation are very strong. You have the sternoclavicular ligament and then also the, also the costoclavicular ligament, which connects the clavicle to the costal cartilages. As I mentioned, this is a very strong joint. You will actually see the clavicle break before you would ever be able to dislocate this joint. So that's our label as our sternoclavicular as a synovial saddle. What about the acromioclavicular? Acromio refers to the acromion of the scapula, clavicular, again, the clavicle. And at this articulation, uh, we're going to be able to see the gliding motion of the scapula on that clavicle. So just as before, let's go ahead and look at this kind of 3D figure here. And this time we are, we, we're already looking at, we already talked about the sternoclavicular joint. Now we're gonna be focusing on the acromioclavicular joint. Here is the clavicle. I've added a, little, added a little asterisk to show where this joint is. And then the acromion here, which I've also highlighted in yellow. And we have a few ligaments that are assisting with this one. The acromioclavicular ligament, so the ligament that actually connects the acromion to the clavicle. And then there's also a coracoclavicular ligament that helps to stabilize this joint. Corico is referring to the coracoid process of the scapula. And then obviously the clavicular part referencing the clavicle. And the acromioclavicular joint is classified as a synovial plane. Next, as we continue to move distally, is the glenohumeral joint. This is uh, the second ball and socket joint. You know, so, so I want you to think about the glenohumeral joint as being analogous to the coxal joint of the lower limb. So you're going to have three planes of motion, abduction and adduction, flexion and extension, and then lateral and medial rotation. And, and multiple of those will contribute to the motion of circumduction also. The term glenohumeral joint comes from the humeral part comes from the humerus itself, and the gleno is referencing the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa of the scapula. I want you to notice how this head of the humerus is much shallower than the head that we saw of the femur. And so because of that, this is actually the most flexible joint of your body, but also the least stable. You'll recall when we were first introducing the concept of articulations, we said how there's an inverse relationship between stability and flexibility. The more flexible a joint is, the less stable it is. The, least, the more stable the joint is, the less flexible it's going to be. So as I said, the glenohumeral joint is going to allow for abduction and adduction, are two types of rotation, which I will say the lateral and medial rotation are much more obvious when you can flex that elbow joint instead of trying to do so with the lower arm in anatomical position. Uh, flexion and extension, and then, as I mentioned, also circumduction. It's these two articulations that we've just talked about, the acromioclavicular joint and the glenohumeral joint, where shoulder separations and dislocations occur, respectively. So a shoulder separation occurs when ligaments that connect the shoulder to the clavicle are stretched or potentially torn. Uh, the severity of that stretching determines the type of treatment. If you have a mild type of strain, such as you see uh, here and this kind of grade one, it might just need to be immobilized with a sling. And if you do get to the point of having a complete tear, such as you see here in this grade two and grade three, those are the kind that may require surgical repair. You'll notice in this grade two, we only have the acromioclavicular ligament that's torn, but a grade three has the acromioclavicular ligament and the coracoclavicular ligament torn. This here, this x-ray that you see right here, here you can see the shoulder separation. This is an x-ray from a 45-year-old male who fell off of his horse. And so you can see how the space between the acromion and the clavicle is wider than it should to be, as well as here is the coracoid process. It's kind of thumb-like projection coming out at you. You can see how that, because that, that um, the head end of the, the acromial end of the clavicle is more superior than it should be. So that implies that there's some ligament damage in the coracoclavicular ligament as well. A shoulder dislocation, on the other hand, um, involves the separation of the humerus from the glenoid cavity of the scapula. That can occur both uh, anteriorly or the head can be pushed posteriorly in a posterior um, dislocation. 
this image that you see right here, let's take a look at this uh, um, in a little more detail. This is the clavicle that you can see here, and there's the acromion. And this kind of oval shape right here looks a little more teardrop shape in this x-ray. That is where the glenoid cavity is. This is the head of the humerus, so this, this humerus should be farther over here. Um, so this is showing you an example of a humeral head that was dislocated anteriorly and slightly inferiorly as well, because you can see how the head is um, a little farther down than it should be. Once we get to the elbow, the elbow itself actually consists of two different joints, the humero ulnar and the humero radial. And as you can probably guess, the humero ulnar is the articulation between the ulna and the humerus and the humero radial between the radius and the humerus. Both of these joints help to facilitate extension and flexion of the forearm. Here's an image, a photograph of some of these bones here, and we can see how the humeroradial joint is an articulation between the capitulum of the humerus and the head of the radius, and that's classified as a synovial hinge. And the humero ulnar joint is between the olecranon of the ulna and the olecranon fossa of the humerus, and that is also classified as a synovial hinge. So hopefully you're starting to see a pattern thus far. We've got all synovial joints um, as we've been moving on, but we have synovial saddle, synovial plane, synovial ball and socket, and two synovial hinges. Now let's move on to the three articulations that occur between the radius and the ulna. This is very similar to what we saw in the lower leg where we had the, where we had the three articulations between the tibia and the fibula. However, I do want you to notice that with these joints, we refer to them as proximal and distal radial ulnar joints, while in the lower limb, we, were we referred to them as superior and inferior. So just keep that in mind as you're looking at these. These are the articulations that allow for the rotation of the radius with respect to the ulna. So for example, you can put your arm out and keep it in a palm up position, but then you can rotate it and put it in a palm down position as well. So both the proximal and distal radial ulnar joints are classified as synovial pivots because of the way they do allow that pivoting motion. And the middle radial ulnar joint is a fibrous syndesmosis, um, which is occurring um, with an interosseous membrane, just as we saw in the lower limb. So if we're looking at those proximal and distal joints, we can see how at the proximal end, the ulna has a notch in it that the head of the radius fits into, and then at the distal end, the radius has a notch that the ulna fits into. So keep in mind that the notches are named based off of the bone that fits into the notch. So the radial notch is on the ulna, the ulnar notch is on the radius. This pivoting motion is what contributes to what we refer to as supination and pronation. So here we're looking at the anterior, the palmar side of the hand of somebody who's in anatomical position. And you can see how these two bones are parallel to each other. That's considered, the, that position is supination. Think about if you were to flex your elbow and put your hand out and hold a cup of soup in your hand, your arm would be in a supinated position. Now if you take your hand and rotate it, so now we're either palm down or palm facing posterior side of your body, that is what's referred to as pronation. And now you can see in a pronated position how these two bones have crossed each other. Now we've had um, our first example of a fibrous joint here, but everything else was still synovial. Um, but we've added in the pivots, so we keep talking about more and more types of synovial. Um, and now let's get down to the point where the forearm is going to articulate with the hand. So this is where you would think about your wrist occurring. A couple different, in a couple different articulations we want to consider here. The radiocarpal, so articulation between essentially the carpal bones of the wrist and the radius, and then the intercarpal articulations between all the different carpal bones. At the radiocarpal joint, think about this as almost being analogous to your ankle, but this is your wrist. You can flex and extend your wrist and then you can also kind of tip it side to side and so that you're have, able to abduct or adduct. But within the bones of your wrist, we just have a gliding motion just like we saw in the intertarsal bones as well. So looking at that wrist, that radiocarpal joint is occurring with the distal, at the distal surface of the radius and then with the three proximal carpal bones, so the scaphoid, the lunate, and the triquetrum. And this is a synovial condylar joint, so think about kind of that circumduction type of motion that you can do at your wrist. 
I want to point out the fact that the ulna does not actually contribute to this motion. And that's because the ulna doesn't directly articulate with those three bones. There's a disc that fits there in the middle that separates that. So the ulna is articulating with the radius right here at its distal end, but it does not directly articulate with the carpal bones. Again, here's a, a coronal uh, section of our radius and our ulna. We can see where um, that radial ulna articulation, that distal radial ulna art articulation would be. Again, the ulna is not articulating with these other carpal bones, but we can see that how all of these carpal bones would be articulating with each other, and all of those are synovial planes. All right, so let's try to think about um, filling this in just as we did before. Only this time I want you to fill it in with all of the, kind of test yourself to fill it in with the appendicular articulations. So this time we do have a fibrous joint. We still don't have any um, fibrous uh, synarthroses because recall that those are the gomphoses and sutures, so we're gonna have to wait till we get to the skull for those. But we do have the middle, middle radial ulnar joint is a fibrous syndesmosis, which is functionally an amphiarthrotic joint. And then everything else is a synovial, but we have a wide variety here. We have synovial planes, we have synovial saddle, um, we have synovial ball and socket, hinge, pivot, and condylar, so um, a pretty wide variety here in the upper limb as to what these synovial joints are going to be. Okay, so you'll notice that we got to the wrist, but we haven't talked um, specifically about the hand yet. We noticed when we were looking at the foot that there were several different structural classifications in there, and we see the same thing as the, in the hand, only with a little more variety as well. So here's what I'd like you to do. This image is available on Blackboard for you to download. I'd recommend doing so. And I'd like you to color in all of these articulations based on their structural classifications. So anywhere you see a hinge, I want you to draw a little red line connecting those bones. If it's a plain purple, saddle blue, pivot yellow, green condylar. So just from this view, looking at, we can see here our, um, our ulna and our radius, our radius and our ulna, all of the carpal bones, our metacarpals, and then all of our phalanges. Among all of those different bones that we're looking at, we can see all five of these types. So just to give you an example, I'm going to go ahead and label this first joint here between the uh, distal phalanx of the fifth digit and the middle phalanx of the fifth digit, and we're going to note that that is a hinge. So go ahead and take a minute and see if you can identify all of the rest of those. So we're going to see... Um, pretty much the exact same thing happening between digits uh, five, four, three, and two. Digit one is going to be the oddball, just as it was in the foot. So we're going to continue to see all of those hinge joints between the distal and middle phalanges and between the middle and the proximal phalanges. When the th we get to the thumb or the pollux, we only have, again, remember, a distal and a proximal bone. And that, that most distal joint is going to be a hinge as well. All of these are referred to as interphalangeal joints because they occur in between adjacent phalanges. So now let's consider what we would see here at the metacarpophalangeal joints. So these are the articulations between the metacarpals and then the proximal phalanges. If we're considering two through five, two through five are all going to have the same classification, structural classification, and all of those are example of condylar joints. So again, think about if you were to just stick out your index finger and kind of rotate it around in a circle, that's showing how you can both flex that articulation at your knuckle and then also abduct and adduct that, that um, that articulation. However, the articulation that's here on the thumb, that is the first metacarpophalangeal joint, but it has a different classification. That is actually a hinge. Now, when you're initially moving your thumb around, you may seem like you have a lot of additional movement in your thumb. So you'd be thinking, well, why is that going to be a, a hinge? But pay very close attention to where that articulation, where that flexibility is coming from. If you really look at just this articulation, you'll see how it really is only indeed a hinge. Go ahead and kind of pinch this bone right here and don't allow this joint to move. And you'll see how all of a sudden you lose the flexibility of that thumb. So then we have the joints that are between the metacarpals and the carpal bones. Again, let's consider two through five and then one separately. If we look at the two through five, we're going to have uh, synovial planes, 
but it's that first one where we're going to have our synovial saddle. This is kind of think about the, the magic joint, the important joint that allows you to have an opposable thumb. That is why you're able to take your thumb and touch it to your pinky. You can't do that with your toes, right? And that's because you don't have a saddle joint there. So again, if you were to kind of sit there and just kind of hold everything else still and move your hand around, you're going to find that it's actually this articulation at kind of right at the beginning, that distal end of your wrist, that's what's giving you all that extra flexibility. And then of course you have all those intercarpal joints, which are planes just like they were in the foot. We'll point out that between the radius and the carpal bones, those radiocarpal joints, we have the, condyl the condylar joints, which we've already mentioned. And then we also mentioned the pivot. So there you go. Those are all of the articulations that you're going to find from the wrist on down. And as you can see, there's a huge variety of structural classifications as well. But being synovial, all of these would functionally be classified as diarthrotic joints.